Um, <clears throat> after the funeral, Colonel did not go to New York, as it's been said, <clears throat> etc. When we got back to Los Angeles, he contacted the William Morris agency. They were the agents for, for Elvis uh, because a, you, a manager had to have an agency to work through. That, I mean, those are just some of the laws in entertainment at that time. And he said, I, this, this merchandising thing is going to be bigger than my staff can handle, Colonel said. He had a very small staff. And he said, we've got to get someone who has knowledge of the, and, and who has experience in merchandising so this can be done properly. It has to be done properly. And they put him in touch um, with Harry uh, Geisler. And uh, they, had, they had meetings and attorneys were there and the whole thing so that it was done properly. But they predated the contract back to the time of Elvis' death mm -hmm. because had they not done that, they would have had no merchandising rights during that period. Right. And it, it just, it saved the estate countless, countless money to do. Mm -hmm. So has that caused trouble? Well, people are saying the Colonel was so cold in business that he made merchandising deals before Elvis was, you know, before uh, he, before a funeral and this kind of thing. Okay, so See, they, they just portrayed Colonel as a totally cold person who cared for nothing but business, mm -hmm. and that he he wasn't upset over Colonel uh, over Elvis' death, right. or he couldn't have been doing business like that. He, uh, I think that any business that he did, and there there had to be business done. Uh, tours had to be canceled. There, you know, all of those things they they have to you have to deal with them. Mm -hmm. That's probably what saved Colonel's vanity. Mm -hmm. Work, yeah. Work. You know, there are times when you just have to throw yourself into something in order to stop thinking about the thoughts that would destroy you. All right. And that's what he did. He went to work. But it was always for Elvis' benefit. There were many entertainers who contacted him about managing them, and he always... He very kindly and very nicely said no. And he said to me, when you've had the best, nothing else will do. And there will never be anyone like Elvis. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know that uh, Ricky Nelson asked, and I know uh, the Beatles asked. The Beatles asked? Mm -hmm. Yeah, after their manager died. Yeah. They did. But, yeah. no, I mean, Elvis, that, that was it. And when you think about it, most managers have several different stars. That right. And, and Colonel always said, if you have time for, for to manage two artists, then you're not giving enough time to, to the one artist. Mm -hmm. He said, my time is all Elvis. See, now that's, that's going to segue me right into my next question, the 50-50 split. Okay. The 50-50 split, although it was a contract and it was on paper, Colonel never took 50%, except for a deal that he personally put together that did not require anything but Elvis likeness. In other words, if, if there was a merchandising product that Colonel came up with the idea, put it together, made it happen, mm -hmm. and Elvis had no personal involvement except to say okay then colonel it was 50 50 because if colonel had not had the idea n nothing would have existed uh, along those lines mm -hmm. but when it came to the the shows the regular management fee he never took 50 percent there was a contract signed saying that he could get 50 percent but when uh, Vernon came to, uh, to uh, Colonel and said, Colonel, uh, we're having some, some problems. Um, and, and well, in January 22, 1976 was when the partnership agreement was signed. And I, I typed it. Mm -hmm. um, 
Brian said, you know, we're running short on cash, and and could you just not take more than your regular third for a while? And Colonel said, that's fine, Vernon. Hmm. And in fact, Elvis died, and Colonel never did get 50%. He just took his regular third. That was it. Hmm. That was it. The partnership contract was signed because at that time, Colonel was very concerned about Elvis' ability to make decisions. Right. And this meant that if Elvis reached a point where he could not make decisions, then Colonel could make them for the partnership. That, right. that never happened. Right. El Elvis was, was able to make decisions right up to the end, you know, but mm -hmm. this was just like an insurance. Now, another question a lot of people ask, uh, I'm trying to think of questions, so, because <laughs> uh, I'm always asked the same things uh, and about the colonel. Uh, Elvis never going outside of the United States. All right, uh, here again, we have a, um, a problem because today there are so many wonderful venues outside the United States that he could have played. In those days, they, they weren't in existence. Elvis did not want to play outdoors. Absolutely. He, he would not play outdoors. And I think that stems back to the early days when the fans almost tore him apart a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, they tore clothes off, the, the whole thing. And when you think of being one person surrounded outside by all of those people, um, it, it would be terrifying if they decide to come down to the stage. And, mm -hmm. and I, I don't mean that they ever meant to hurt him. But you get people grabbing for pieces of clothing and so forth, and it's going to be painful. <laughs> yeah. So he didn't want to play outside. Most of the venues at that time were outside venues. Mm -hmm. There are rumors that Colonel had this offer, that offer, and another offer. When... When, yes, there were a couple offers that were extended, but when it came right down to saying, do you have the money, they didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, a colonel will get it because the, the prices they were going to charge would have been so astronomical. No fan could have afforded it. Right. And <laughs> colonel said, no, if, if we're going to play overseas, the people who really love Elvis need to be there and these people they couldn't afford to go mm -hmm. now um, Charlie Stone and you know Charlie mm -hmm. has told me several times that when Elvis died he had plane reservations to go overseas to check out venues to see if there were any venues that could be used so yep. Colonel was planning to do that yep. he told me the same thing yeah yep uh -huh. Now, a lot of people blame that on the colonel, saying, you, you know, illegal citizen and all that. Come on. Colonel, I know. I, I'm trying to, I'm not Joe Klein. <laughs> uh, colonel was good friends with several presidents of the United States. And if you are close to a president, believe me, the Secret Service has checked you out, and they know your past and forward history. Yeah. I'm trying to think of everything Joe, what someone is going to uh, say. Joe, how could you how could you land overseas with guns and drugs? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would have, and a lot of those countries, well, a lot of them would have just gloried in arresting Elvis. Sure, look when they nailed the Beatles. Yep, and Frank Sinatra was nailed down in Australia. Hmm. Colonel, one of Colonel's prime objectives was to protect Elvis at all costs. That was it. He, he would do anything to protect him. Mm -hmm. and but he couldn't protect him from himself. No. Mm -hmm. No one could do that but him. And, and you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. It tears you apart to think about it. Mm -hmm. Everything that was done that anyone around Elvis knew to do. Everything was done and it just didn't work. It didn't work. Can I ask you about um, the uh, the lawsuit uh, 
from EPE to uh, Colonel Parker, uh, the judge over uh, Lisa Marie. Can I tell you about that? I mean, can you tell me about that? Of course. Um, February of 1980, there was um, a company that wanted to do some filming, or they wanted to lease some of the contents of the trophy room at Grace. And Colonel went to the estate and said, um, is this something that you will approve? And uh, the advance rent was about $400,000 they were going to pay to, to lease these items. And because it was a very unusual transaction, um, the co-executors, requested approval from the probate court in Tennessee. And February of that 1980, Judge Evans signed a court order for a guardian ad litem to be appointed for Lisa Marie because she was underage. In other words, the court says, we're going to appoint a guardian to protect her interests since she is too young to, to make decisions herself. And this guardian was appointed in May. In June, this man came to see Colonel in the RCA Record Tours office in Los Angeles. I was in the office that day. I was not in the room with Colonel and the, the appointed guardian. Um, but when he left, when this man left, I heard him say, Colonel, after our conversation today, I think you will be pleased with my report. Mm -hmm. That was early June. In sep late September of 1980, this man filed in the probate court of Shelby County, Tennessee, a scathing criticism of Colonel's work. Now, this is the same man that said, you're going to like my report. In the meantime, they asked Colonel for a great deal of information from his files, and anything they wanted, Colonel said to his, his staff, get it together, give them whatever they want. He said, I've done nothing wrong. They're going to find out I've done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the, the court of Tennessee said that Colonel Parker should be sued. Now, the estate said no. We do not think the Colonel has done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. But the court said you, I mean, the court ordered the estate to bring a suit. There were no problems with Colonel and his estate. It was the it was the court of Tennessee that thought there was a problem, mm -hmm. and there was never actually they never sued. This this drug on this started in 1980, mm -hmm. and it wasn't finished until June of 1983. And how was it finished? I mean. He didn't, you didn't, he didn't lose. No. In fact, um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Colonel, in the beginning, you know, Colonel would not defend himself to the press or anyone else because he kept saying to me, I've done nothing wrong. I have nothing to defend. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't need to defend myself. You defend yourself if you're guilty. He said, I'm not guilty. And as time went on and it got worse and worse, and, and Colonel really suffered over this. He was the man who had done the best he could all of, all of Elvis' career. He did the best he could, and then suddenly everyone was saying, you cheated him, you did this, you did that, and he, and he didn't. He didn't. Well, Finally, he said, he said, I've, I've had it. This is enough. I mean, they have one, I'm not going to go into all the details, but they aren't nice. They aren't pretty what they did to Colonel, or mm -hmm. tried to do. And 
he finally said, you know, I've had it. And he said to his attorney, I want this settled and I want it finished. They refused. They, they, would, they would say they were have a meeting, then they would postpone it. Then they would do something else. He said, I'm tired of it. I want to get on with my life and we're going to end it. They, and so they advised the, the people in Tennessee that Colonel was going to bring a lawsuit in Nevada, in Las Vegas, where all of the partnership papers had been signed, and that he was going to sue the people who were talking about suing him mm-hmm. because they had stopped this partnership from doing business, and that's illegal. They couldn't prove anything. They wouldn't take. They w- didn't go to court. They didn't take any definite legal steps to sue him. Mm-hmm. But the partnership, in the meantime, was just in limbo. Right. And when one partner cannot act in a partnership, the partnership reverts to the the surviving partner or the partner who can't continue it. And he said, if they want to go to court, they're talking about it, but they won't come down to doing it, fine, let's go to court. I'll take it to them. Mm -hmm. I'll sue them, and I will end up with the whole thing. I'm the surviving partner. There's nothing they could do. And then they decided to pay Colonel and settle it. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. He Mm -hmm. was the one who was paid, so who won? Right. <laughs> it's just, that's just it. Mm-hmm. Um, the book uh, that Alana Nash uh, wrote, which I think is a piece of garbage, and I've, I've said that actually on my show, uh, she says the, the murder charges, and I am surprised that she can even make a claim like that. You know, uh, Alana must have been totally desperate for something to sell her book. She tried, she shopped it around for years and no publisher would touch it. Mm-hmm. Um, that is just such a lame, silly thing to bring up. It's, here we go again, this is just something that she found, it, to me it was a marketing device to get a little attention. Mm-hmm. And it was used too. Oh, sad that it yeah. doesn't even bear talking about. Yeah, and she did use that, too. I mean, it was... Of course she did. Yeah. But she also said in her book that I wanted to take over the estate in Colonel's place. Well, that's the most stupid thing I ever heard. <laughs> 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 I'm not a businesswoman. Come on. Uh, no, no. When did you leave uh, RCA? I mean, well, I mean... Like we kind of danced all around everything because I wanted to ask you questions that haven't been answered. You know, there's a lot of Elvis and, and, things that everybody knows. I'm it, going to have to limit our time. Um, now, I mean, we we could go on for days. Believe yeah. Me. <laughs> but um, would it be possible to talk to you again, especially because I got to get in some. Uh, uh, well, let's let's give about give us about another 15 minutes. How's that? Okay. Um, and I'm going to let you ask me questions, and I'm not going to... Okay. Sahara Tahoe. I need stories about the Sahara Tahoe. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a lot of stories about Sahara Tahoe. Number one, I was working, you know. Uh, we all, <laughs> even on the road, uh, I, I used to laugh and say I saw all of these cities uh, from a, a rearview mirror uh, because the limo would pick us up at the airport. The driver would be driving. Colonel would sit me in the middle between the driver and him. I mean, the driver, myself, and the colonel would be sitting in the front seat of the limo. So all I was really seeing was that rear view mirror. Mm-hmm. Um, we 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 were working most of the time, but can't it's a think lovely of lovely place. It's a wonderful place. Um, Elvis loved it. Uh, but as far as any little stories about it? No, you'll have to ask some of his guys about that. Mm-hmm. Um, do, you, do you remember the uh, the threats on Elvis's life? Uh huh. Of course. And we took them very seriously. And there were a number. There were so many that people never heard of. Um, and on the road, <laughs> there were there were so many things that happened. Um, let's. I'll just go back to one 
one venue. Um, Colonel, of course, always went. To, we 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 would fly into a town way in advance of the show. We had a, we had a staff. Um, Colonel and and uh, his his people would go to the to the building to talk to the building manager. One of the RCA record tours men, Pat Kelleher, would go to the hotel, make hotel arrangements, etc. Someone else uh, would would contact the radio station or something. Everyone had their job to do. I would stay on the plane, and they brought their notes back to me, and I would type their notes at the next stop when they were out doing their business. And um, but the day of the show, Colonel and, and the whole group would be at, at the building to make sure that everything was ready and safe for Elvis. One of Elvis' men always, always traveled with us. And he would go into uh, the suite where Elvis was going to be staying. He would make all the preparations for Elvis' comfort. He would make sure it was totally secure. And, of course, there would be uh, the local police force, off-duty policemen who were hired uh, to, to be there and, and make sure that, you know, that was our security there. Well, at this one building, uh, the police chief came to the colonel and he said, Colonel, he said, we've had a phone call that there's a bomb in the building. And Colonel said, well, what are you doing about it? And he said, well, um, he said, uh, we're going to have to search the building. We're, and, and this was, oh, a couple hours before show. He said, we're going to have to do a thorough search of the building, and it's, but you're going to have to pay a lot of extra policemen. It's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars. And Colonel said, well, exactly. What did the person say when they called? And the police um, officer said, well, they said there's a brown paper bag and there's a, a, a bomb in it. And Colonel said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, you can go ahead and have the building searched with your off-duty policemen, but we're going to be outside the building, and until you bring me a brown paper bag, the show will not go on, and you're going to have to get up on stage and explain to the people why there is no show. And the policeman looked a little strange and said, um, you know, Colonel, we think that was a crank call. I, I don't <laughs> there were all kind of things like that that <laughs> did it did that happen a lot when people try to get one over uh, on, on the colonel oh yeah oh yeah can you in it please okay i have another call coming in and it, it's, it's been coming in repeatedly i'll be right back okay yeah a lot of things happened yeah. Now, when did you switch over from working for RCA? I mean, did you ever just start working for Elvis's crew and uh, just for the Colonel, or did were you always working? Um, I I was always working for RCA Records. I was never employed by the Colonel or Elvis. Uh huh. The RCA Record tours. Wow. In fact, they kept me they kept me on the payroll even after um, Elvis died. They kept me on the payroll for a couple of years. Wow. Yeah, that because, wasn't because they were still doing, uh, you know, they were recycling the recordings and things like that. Mm -hmm. I never worked. I was never on Colonel's payroll. Mm -hmm. As his wife, I worked free. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was incredible after his death. I mean, you could not keep records inside stores. I mean, how did they ever keep up with it? I mean, being an RCA employee, how did they ever keep up with it? Well, believe me, they just revved up day and night. They were they were making, the, you know, they were pressing records and so forth. Did they expect something like that to happen? No. You know, Joe, we didn't expect Colonel to, or Ellis to die when he died. Yeah, but, I mean, but it, no, it kept on going. I mean, they kept buying and buying and buying, and, and, and stores were selling out. And it was like, oh, my God, I've never seen such a, and I've never seen no, it again. Well, no one predicted that would happen either. I mean, no one, it was a big surprise. It was a huge surprise. Really? And for Colonel and, and you know, for all of us who loved Elvis, we were thrilled. We were just thrilled. Today, young people are starting to become fans, and I just think that's the most wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. It is. Name any big artist who's been dead 30 years 
and and you 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 give that name to someone who's in their early twenties, and they'll just look at you like, who is that? Right. Right. But everybody knows who Elvis is. Yeah. Well, what do you think about his uh, ever his everlasting popularity? I think it's well deserved. Yeah. The man had an amazing voice, and he changed music. Mm-hmm. He did. In the early days, he was, again, if I could only take everyone back to the 50s, if, if I could take you back there, oh. and you could see what it was like. Number one, when a parent told you to do something, you didn't say why or ask for an explanation. You did it. Or you got punished. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not talking about brutalizing children, no. <laughs> but today, a parent says to the child, do something, and they, they, they might look them right in the eye and say, I'm not going to. And nothing happened. It, I, just, I can't tell you how rigid the, the social rules were back then. And, and if you did the kind of dancing back then, the way they do today, the police actually would come into a dance area and arrest people for getting too close. It was, it was just, and Elvis moving, that, that was, well, there were ministers who from the pulpit were saying, the devil is behind this. He's ruining our children. We've got to stop him. They would have big, big get-togethers where they would throw all of his 45 records in a fire. It was, it was just, oh, it was horrible. And the people thought Elvis was ruining their children. You can't imagine that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, it's so different now. It's just, it, I just can't even explain the difference that Elvis made. He mm-hmm. brought a certain freedom to the young people that they had never had before. And when Colonel negotiated his deal with RCA Records, and Colonel was not his manager at that time, Colonel was hired by um, Elvis' parents to, to um, because Bob Neal was Elvis' manager, and Bob Neal had shopped every record company that existed and was turned down. Wow. And Elvis' parents hired Colonel to negotiate uh, the record agreement. And until that time, the A&R man at a record company chose the material that an artist was to record. An artist would walk into the recording studio and the sheet music would be there. This is what you're going to record for this album. Colonel's contract for Elvis read that Elvis was to choose his material. And that made history. Mm-hmm. Today, can you imagine any of the recording artists today being told what to record? Not even seeing the stuff before they were expected to, to sing it? Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, that's true. So, I mean, so many things the two of them did that just, just changed me to think. Yeah. And, and I'm just so grateful they, they lived and they did this for us. I thank you very much for calling me. Uh, if you ever get bored and want to talk to somebody, <laughs> <laughs> I am always home and got much of a life. 